Well, good evening, everyone. It looks like uh, all the trustees are here. And the old clock on the wall says it's six o'clock, so we will go ahead and begin. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 24th meeting of the North Idaho College Trustees. Uh, I've been informed that there are no uh, comments this evening. And so uh, the first thing we'll do is verify the quorum. We have all the trustees uh, on Zoom. And uh, we've had an opportunity to review the minutes. And so are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? If not, they will stand as published. Um, tonight, we are fortunate to have, uh, well, let me back up. Uh, we typically read the mission statement for uh, the college and uh, Brad Murray has volunteered to do that tonight. Happy to do that on a volunteer basis, of course. North Idaho College mission statement. North Idaho College meets the diverse educational needs of students, employers, and the Northern Idaho communities it serves through a commitment to student success, educational excellence, community engagement, and lifelong learning. Thank you, Trustee Murray. Tonight, we are uh, very fortunate to have a celebrating su success, which we haven't had in the last uh, couple of meetings. And uh, tonight, we've got Ken Wardinsky, and Thomas Scott to talk about information technology and e-learning. So Ken and Tom, you're, Thomas, you're, uh, you're on. Uh, thank you, Chair Dunlap, trustees, President McLennan and guests. Um, it's so nice to have this opportunity to have a celebrating success and talk about uh, information technology and e-learning uh, as it relates to really our COVID-19 response on campus. And I think it's, I don't know if it's ironic, ironic or fitting that we're sitting here doing this um, through Zoom and I'm sitting at home presenting remotely uh, for this presentation. Um, to give you some context on this, um, things happen in a very short time frame. Um, I'm a little bit unaware if President McLennan knew that March 20th was my birthday when he announced on March 17th that the entire campus was working, going to go remotely and kind of drop that bombshell on us. Um, so things happened in a very quick timeline. Uh, I was on the crisis response team, so I had some idea of what was going on, but um, when an IT person hears that in four days you're moving an entire campus remotely, uh, panic does ensue a little bit. Um, on March 23rd, that Monday, most of the workforce uh, did uh, show up to work remotely. And then on March 25th, if you skip down, is when the governor actually issued the uh, stay at home order way back for the 21 days. So NIC was a bit proactive in its estimate of working remotely. Um, through the following uh, 10 days, IT continued to start this, uh, de this process of making sure that our remote workers all had what they needed. And then um, the timeline here goes into April when we actually started uh, really addressing student needs as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. And then on June 15th, as many of you know, we entered stage four of our rebounds plan, which brought most of the workers back to campus. And uh, we kind of are phasing out of the remote work, um, kind of in a hybrid mode. One of the biggest things that made this a success for us is really the, um, the support of IT at the campus in general. So since the five years that I've been here, we've really moved our technology to a modern platform and really provided tools that made this a successful transition to be able to work remotely. With the equipment re replacement schedule that the college does, IT already had a standard where every laptop that we buy for faculty had a built-in webcam and microphone. So we didn't have to get additional things. We already had moved our phone system with partnership with Admetics to a hosted system to allow us to have remote phone access um, anywhere from the world really. We had already had uh, the ability that uh, several people had done to work from home and remote into their desktops um, securely. And that was a benefit of just extending that access. Uh, we're using Zoom today and Zoom has been very successful. We already had prior licensing to Zoom. It was already uh, beginning to roll out on campus, primarily for a tie into our IVC classes, but not necessarily to the extent that we used Zoom over this time period. And you've probably seen the commercials for Microsoft Teams. 
Uh, we also had that, that was a kind of a smaller rollout for student services, IT and e-learning, and the campus really took to that tool very successfully. We addressed multi-factor authentication. So a lot of times you log into a bank in a different machine and they text you a code that you have to put in. We already had that technology in place for uh, anyone accessing offsite information at NIC for anything that could contain personally identifiable information. So our student information system, email, those type of things. Remote storage was another factor so that you didn't have to actually connect to our network. We have that in the cloud through Box and OneDrive. And we already had remote desktop access that we use with students, which allows a student to call the help desk. And then if they have internet access, we can actually remote into their machine. They can see what's happening and help them. And then we've really pushed to move most of our services to web-based, which allows internet access from anywhere. So most of our systems were already set up to be accessed remotely. And then from the e-learning side, NIC made the wise decision to automatically create a course shell for every single course that we offered, whether it was online or not. And uh, Dr. Scott will talk to that in a little bit. One of the biggest challenges was moving the phones. So it's easy to forward a phone to your cell phone, but when you have to call a student back, a lot of times you would be using your personal phone and exposing that number for a faculty member. So we were able to basically take a physical phone and then through our partnership with our provider, create a software phone. So if you have a headset and microphone, you could treat it just like in a call center. The difficulty with that is that we had to actually add configuration for every individual phone. And my hat's off to Stuart Loberg and CJ Banks on my team who created 156 configurations within about three days. So they just kind of went nose down and got it done. In total, we had 203 employees that had soft phones working remotely. Um, and this also included general phone lines too for financial aid or Cardinal Central. Zoom is where things get a little bit crazy. Um, you can see our utilization in December was just kind of moderate here, but when things hit in March and April, it really skyrocketed. The impressive number is that NAC generated 1.9 million minutes of meetings, content over 6,172 meetings. If you put that in perspective of 525,000 minutes in a year, NIC generated over three and a half years worth of video content in Zoom meetings over almost a four month span, which is an incredible number when you think about it. It also means that we were in a lot of meetings connected virtually. From the Microsoft Teams perspective, Teams is a chat tool where you can actually just chat with somebody um, really quickly. We did almost 400,000 chat messages in the time frame of December to um, today. Actually, yesterday is when my numbers were. We did 53 or 5,312 calls because you can also video call through Teams and 530 actual team meetings. Prior to March, that number was 63,000. And then just from March to June, that number of text messages and chat messages jumped to 300, almost 330,000 messages. What I'm trying to show here is because we had these tools in place, normally in IT, we try to do a communication plan, training, adoption before, and the users kind of slowly get that. Our users took to this very quickly and really successfully over this time. Looking at direct student support, we're really kind of proud of what IT was able to do here. Uh, initially, we didn't um, uh, issue laptops to students, but then we realized we have all these labs that don't have anybody that can physically go in them. So we were able to take those laptops and issue them to students. We did this by a faculty referral because we know that our faculty know our students the best. So if a faculty member had a student that they knew there was a need, they could refer them to, they could do a referral to IT, and then we issued this, the student a physical laptop. Uh, in total, we issued 45 students' laptops. Um, we also were able to allow remote access to the library and our lab machines. Um, so we had about 75 hours of use for that. This wasn't used as much, but if a student needed uh, remote access to a specialized software, they could do that. We also looked at our vendors for uh, some of the higher end programs for AutoCAD and the Adobe Suite. And those um, vendors were very uh, nice to higher education in the fact that they allowed um, the student to directly download that on their, on their home machines and use NIC licensing so they didn't have to purchase that in addition. And then they were able to continue their studies. One of the biggest highlights that I really like is that we worked with workforce training to ensure that all of the apprenticeship programs could continue. Because as you know, many of those students, if they're not in the apprenticeship program receiving education, lose their employment. 
Uh, a huge shout out to Brenda Hamilton, who was just a rock star at workforce training and spent hours and hours uh, really making sure that her apprenticeship students were there. And then on my team, I assigned Rochelle Williams and Neil Doyle to, to provide direct support. And that was a very successful uh, way for them to continue their um, education as well and, and provide a good experience. Um, we also provided information on best places to access the, uh, our Wi-Fi from parking lot areas. Um, most of our Wi-Fi is contained within the buildings, but we have certain areas outside that students could do basically drive up Wi-Fi because we couldn't provide uh, internet to them at home, but we could make it available to them since they couldn't come into the buildings. And then we helped the student services start to facilitate online informational video series, which were public meetings that students could come in and get information about what was going on. And that was a huge series that's going to extend into the fall semester. On the faculty side, uh, we basically had minimal uh, issuance of things that we had to do. So 20, 20 webcams, some headsets, monitors, some laptops to, student, uh, to faculty who, didn't ha who maybe had a tower in their office and needed a laptop. Uh, we also published a working remotely resource guide that um, all faculty and staff could go and get kind of tips and tricks on how to work with IT remotely. We did a video blog with our uh, faculty and our staff constituency leaders on 20 questions with IT, which were just general questions about what was going on with um, COVID and how you can work better at home. And we also, I also produced an eight week straight talk series, which was just uh, over lunch on Wednesdays talking about different issues somewhat related to COVID, but also just in general as an educational series for the campus. Um, and then from our call log volume, you can see that the calls to the help desk increased about 2000 calls from where we were last year at this time. And we got about 2000 more tickets um, that were logged into our system. The difference here is um, most of the time we receive more student requests than faculty requests. And obviously in this nature, we actually had more staff and faculty request help than students, but we got through it pretty successfully. Um, and then before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Scott, I just wanna do a special thank you to this team here. Uh, Steve Smith, Holly Moore, Steve Baum, Luke Russell, Brandon Lucas, Jeremy Seda, and Craig Lytle. This is what we would call the essential workers. And these individuals were on campus supporting everyone working remotely the entire time that we were working remotely. So just a huge shout out to them for their commitment to show physically at the office every single week. And with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Scott. Thanks, Ken. Uh, let me start out by saying I really appreciate Ken and, and the partnership that we have with IT. We've, we've come a long way and we, we work really closely together. And I think that that has huge impacts of us going forward. Um, let me also say, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to celebrate some of the work that e-learning office has done and IT has done. Um, you know, so much of what we do happens behind the scenes. Um, and it was kind of interesting uh, the other day, Dr. McLennan referenced the Maytag repairman and I had to Google that and kind of remember that because I might be showing some aging there when we talk about the Maytag repairman, but a lot of, a lot of the systems and a lot of the things that we have put together really run themselves and run well. And so uh, a lot of times we get involved, the behind the scenes people get involved when things aren't working. And so um, from this timeline, uh, you know, what you can really see is how rapidly things got started. And I will say on March 5th, I was reached out by other e-learning folks that I'm, I'm friends with within our e-learning community. And we all started talking about what was going on. If you look, campus was closed on the 23rd. We already on March 5th had already started within an e-learning community, started sharing resources with each other. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of those resources as we go along. Uh, based upon those resources, we decided to keep, uh, create a keep teaching site. Um, basically, it was a way to provide information to faculty to move their content online and had best practices and things to consider when really considering students and where the students were at that time because um, you know a lot of these students didn't choose to move online and so I, I really felt like we needed to be conscious of that and take a student perspective. One of the other early things that I did was I reached out to all of our vendors to make sure that um, capacity was there that they really could um, handle this and we got assurance from every one of our vendors and I will say throughout the entire process. Um, I'll give you an example. Canvas took however many years to get to 1 million users and they doubled that users within a two month pan span. So whatever it took them to get to like 15 years, they doubled it within like a two months, two month time frame. So 
uh, where were our vendors? Where were we with that? And so we had to purchase new software. Um, you know, obviously our staff moved rem remotely. Um, two of us were considered essential. So we stayed on campus and it was funny for about two months. It was basically Chris, uh, me and, and Lita that were in the building. And so we always looked forward to Lita coming by and saying hi to us in the morning and giving us sort of like a team talk in the morning. And I was like, wow, we got, we, we were getting this open access to the vice president all the time now. And it was so nice because, <laughs> you know, it, we, we, because we were here, but you know, it, it's kind of isolating even being here by ourselves. And so having each other to kind of talk to and, 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 and be around each other was great. Um, we started offering webinars every week and, you know, Technology, even in the middle of that, we had updates to Canvas. Uh, you know, the world keeps moving on. And so we had introduced all of these new features with Canvas. And as Ken said, towards the end there, once we got the site license for Zoom, um, we really moved to try to integrate that because we did see uh, uh, a lot of folks that were interested in that. So let's talk about some of these success factors. Um, I, you know, I will start by saying that our success story is NIC's success story. So many faculty, staff, and students have risen to the occasion, not, not just us. And I think that we're really happy to be a part of that. I think um, while we're, we're recognizing, you know, IT and e-learning, I think that there are lots of heroes out there um, that were part of this. Um, Ken already mentioned it. You know, we had pre-established Canvas course shells, so we didn't have to move rapidly to build all these things. We have a integrated syllabus that's part of everybody's course. And so Canvas has been a way to deliver that information. Um, we had software already built in or measures in place. So um, one of the things that uh, Ken, uh, Ken talked about was Zoom. We have an internal thing that's called Canvas Conferences, Big Blue Button. And it's basically uh, a conferencing tool that's built into your class so that you don't have to go outside of your class. Um, TechSmith Nomia is our uh, media replay back. And so um, I'll show you some statistics that are pretty shattering at the end, but this is where faculty would record themselves and then make those videos available to, uh, to students. And both of those tools saw a huge, huge um, influx of new users. Um, you know, the e-learning office has ongoing training. We run training every semester. Faculty participate in that training. And so I think having a robust online face-to-face -face training regimen is, is, is important because um, you know, we're, we're keeping up with the trends. We're always keeping up with the new things that are out there. Um, we have lots of robust resources. And I will say that Canvas itself, just moving to Canvas itself uh, was a success factor uh, a couple of years ago because it's an easier system to use. Students find it to be easier to use. Uh, kudos to our faculty. I will say that a lot of our faculty are very experienced teaching online. Um, you know, when we talked about this transition of moving to online, one of the things that was important to think about is that a lot of the faculty already taught classes online. And so when they had to move their content, um, it was very easy for them. And so, you know, kudos to our faculty for having experience. And then kudos to our staff. Um, you know, our staff, uh, this staff has been together for about three years in this whole entire unit. And so, you know, we've gone through the, the pains of migrating from Blackboard into Canvas. And, and if you've never migrated from one system to the other, uh, that's a huge undertaking. So I just want to put a shout out there to my staff and all the work that they've done at home. Uh, they've been working from home, except for Chris. All of these folks have been working from home, working remotely. Um, and, and we know what a challenge that can be. So uh, these are the two sites I wanted to show you really quickly. Um, the first one is the remote teaching resources for business continuity. And so this was the document I was showing you that was shared to me on the 5th. And I will say that when this document started, there was only about 35 schools on here. Uh, now you can obviously see if you want to scroll to the end, Ken, at the end, there was over uh, about 440 institutions that had collaborated on this one document. And this one document had uh, different types of uh, continuity plans for different institutions. And uh, of course, at that beginning, it was this huge resource sharing. I was, you know, of course, it was actually too much resource sharing because I would get bombarded with emails and then I would forward those to the deans and vice presidents. And it was kind of like this, uh, there was so much information going on and I was getting a lot of information. And so, but this was a great resource for us to build upon um, when we went to it. And so um, he's going to show you the Keep Teaching site. And this is the site that my staff developed, and it was called Keep Teaching. Can you go to the homepage, Ken? So, you know, we, we looked at some research articles. We looked at the best articles um, that we felt 
would be the most important. Um, teaching with empathy, thinking about uh, students and their situations, always considering the student as we move forward. Um, you know, there, there's some good stuff out there. And so we channeled all that and put that into a location that faculty could, um, could access if you go to the modules pin. And so you can see a lot of the topics are creating a weekly agenda. How do you communicate with students from a distance? How do you foster collaboration? And then we went through all of our tools and decided to, to, to make sure that we talk about all the different self-paced um, tools and how to do different things within Canvas. And if, if you just click on one, Ken, if you can click on the discussion boards, I mean, Canvas makes it so easy. It's picture by picture, step by step. I mean, it cannot be as easy to figure out how to do things as you wanted. And, and these resources were available for faculty. And we updated these resources as we went along. Um, here are the webinars. So we ran a weekly webinar series that was about two to three webinars per week, every week. Um, you know, and, and I would say that interestingly enough, our two most popular ones were the last three um, because we were had to move testing online in a rapid way. Um, we did adopt a new software and we did have to train faculty on how to use that software. Um, and, and that was the first time we had ever tried to train people 100% remotely. Um, so that was kind of a kind of interesting and a learning experience for that. Um, and then once we had that Zoom integration turned on, uh, we went right with it with IT. And that was the first time we've actually really partnered on a workshop together. And I think we had 60 faculty members attend in, a, in three sessions only. So that's, uh, you can see um, how important they felt that can, uh, Zoom was and how important Zoom may be going forward. And so now faculty have the choice within Canvas to use Zoom or what we call the big blue button. So Ken got to show his stats and I'm gonna show you some of my stats. And Ken, I won't try to compare my stats to your stats, but I, I will show you one stat that's gonna be pretty earth shattering. So um, as you can see, I did a comparison between the spring semester from last year, a typical spring and a spring semester from uh, this year. And I think the major thing to look at is how many page views were there were. 66.5 um, million pages were viewed inside of Canvas over the spring semester. That is for our school. I mean, think about that. That is, that is astronomical. Media recordings, which are faculty have the ability to create little recordings within their class, like, hi, how are you doing? Or if you have a paper, you could say, oh, you did really well on the paper. It adds a layer to the courses, so it's not just text heavy. There's some video there. There's some audio there. That went from 602 media recordings to 1,471 recordings. And so let's get into the, the good stuff here. Um, announcements almost doubled, which is not surprising. Um, and this is the one I want to say. Ken said they had, let me look at your statistics, Ken. They had, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to do a comparison, Ken, but I want to say you had 6,172 meetings in Zoom. We had 50,537 big blue button conferences. And that means that is a faculty to student conference. That could be an office hour. That could be a class that they taught. That is astronomical to be honest with you um, I'm not sure that I'm not a math person I can't tell you what the increase of that is but 50,000 is is a, is a big number um, and you obviously can see more quizzes were added uh, I think that's a di direct um, result of, of moving to canvas and then let's look at our video playback that was kind of an interesting one for us too so you can see in January and February which was a normal month for us um, but then you get into April and May, and we saw a 4,686% increase in the use of video storage. That is, uh, that's the amount of bandwidth. So that's how much uh, bandwidth people are using to watch those videos. So you can see in May, May was huge. I mean, a lot of our students were really consuming uh, course material through a multimedia type of format. And, and, and to me, that's really exciting, to be honest with you. And to be honest with you, uh, our vendor said normally our school is running at a higher rate than a lot of other schools to begin with at our size. Um, you can look at the amount of videos that were just created. I mean, in April, we created 2,500 videos. In May, 1,500 videos. In March, 1,700 videos. I mean, these are our faculty working. They are creating this content for their students. Um, once again, 129% increase. And then just viewing of videos, right? I mean, these, this is just directly students watching that content. Um, you can see in April, we pushed up to 53,000 uh, users, individual clicks on a watch. So um, I think that this, what shows you is that, you know, 
the systems were in place, these systems didn't go down with these increases. I mean, a 4,600% increase, that system never went down once. Um, we did have some problems with Canvas and a few things here and there. But once again, like I said, when you double your entire user base within a month time frame. Um, so those are the statistics we have. I, I just want to say thank you to my staff for doing such a great job um, and, and rising to the call. And, um, you know, we're here to continue to rise to the call no matter what happens. I mean, we're, 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 we're ready to go. And I say preparation is 100% the key. So. And, and I'll just add that, you know, we, we're, we're proud of the statistics and the tools that were used, but really the, the, the success of this is just the entire campus and the way that they really embrace change in a quick way. And uh, to Thomas's point, there are so many success stories out there. Uh, you know, the determination of our faculty to make this work, uh, the determination to support the students and everyone else. And we are just really glad that we can have the tools in place to support them. Um, and, you know, nothing's 100% perfect when you scramble it this way. Um, but even building off of this good foundational layer, as we roll into the fall semester with different um, modalities of online instruction and hybrid and, you know, all these things, I think we can only get better on what we do if we just do it strategically. And with that, I will, uh, if we'll answer any questions. Thank you, Ken and Thomas. I believe uh, Dr. McLennan has some comments for you to begin with. Thank you, uh, Chair Dunlap. I, I just wanted to, to add that part of the reason for having this presentation tonight, uh, while, while Ken and, and uh, Thomas, you're, you're, you're I mean, absolutely correct in terms of the adoption and it took everybody to work together to make this work, but having the tools in place and the, the sophistication of the tools and the planning that went into this over many years to get here, uh, it really did put us, and does put us best in class. And I think I wanted the board to see the, just on some level, the detail and the sophistication that went into this. Uh, and those and those stats and, and, and all that give you some of that. Uh, Thomas, I, I was wondering when I, when I referenced the Maytag Repairman, if you would, if you would have a connecting uh, point to this. I'm glad you I'm glad you looked at that. The other, the other reason that I wanted the board to see this in particular is, as I've talked publicly about what NIC has been doing, um, I've, I've highlighted the preparation that enabled us to be doing this work at the level that we're doing it. And again, that's, that's everybody that's been involved in that. But more, most importantly, is as we're talking with communities like uh, Bonners Ferry, uh, our rural communities, and even Future Forward serving other segments of our uh, northern region that we're not quite reaching yet, the movement towards this virtual college, I, I wanted you to see how confident I am in the tools we've already put into place and the resources that we have that are putting us well on our pathway to get there. And um, so when I say we've learned a lot from COVID-19 and we think we can do more and we can do better and we know we can operate differently, more fully, future forward, um, you, can, you get some idea of the credibility behind those statements. So Ken, Thomas, thank you very much, and thank your team. Uh, outstanding work. Board, other uh, comments or questions for Ken or Thomas? Mr. Chair? Yes, Trustee Wood. Well, yes, I, a well, couple of questions, not dr for a few different people. For Ken, first of all, Ken, you I think you had about seven names up there. Is that the size of the IT staff? Oh, no, I have uh, about... There were seven names on there. I have a staff of about 30. Okay. And uh, that seemed pretty slim, seven. <laughs> but um, also, I would love a copy of that PowerPoint. So when you get time, send us that. And then, you know, Rick, you talked about planning. And I would absolutely, under Joe's um, leadership, he really highlighted the need to plan for IT all those years ago. And it's one of our ongoing line items. I can't remember the amount, uh, maybe Chris is online. I think it's 250,000 that we set aside just to address. I not Chris, are you there? I am. I think you're speaking of the equipment replacement fund that is um, okay. really unique to NIC. And I would agree with you. It, it's really helped us create a great backbone. Yeah, and it, it's quite clear that this that PowerPoint was fantastic, but it's quite clear that the level of preparation um, years in advance, and then of course the kind of IT staff that we have and 
and all the committed professionals helped us. <laughs> You'll see all of you talk about we can do better. So that's the NIC spirit, but really um, incredible job through all of this. So good presentation. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Mr. Chair. Trustee Howard. Yes. Uh, Ken and Thomas, I want to thank you very much. Um, you know, as a trustee, we kind of sit on the perimeter um, and um, we watch what goes on at the college. And when this COVID-19 hit and all of the ramifications of that, all you can do is sit back and wonder and hope that we're going to be able to rise to the challenge. And as I listen to your presentation tonight, I got to tell you, I'm very, very pleased. Um, the, um, the idea that you, you've responded so quickly and so well is very heartening. And I'll tell you, it, it bodes well for the future of NIC because I think the future is more uh, headed in your direction than you think. Um, and you've uh, already uh, met the challenge very well. So I want to thank all of you and thank your staff and the people who worked on this. It's pretty impressive. I got to tell you, half of the presentation I did not understand because you're using those phrases and words and things like that. What I did understand is you did a hell of a good job. Thank you. Chair Dunlap? Yes, Trustee Murray. Yeah, I'd just like to express uh, how impressed I am with the uh, response from Ken's department in uh, very unusual circumstances. It's amazing what can get done when people are, are focused on what needs to get done. So. Kudos to you guys. Thanks for the job you do. I was speaking with a uh, math instructor last month and she had never taught online before. And she was just effusive in the praise and the impact of distance learning and how important it was to her now. And in parting, she shook her finger at me and said, now you make sure that you and that board don't defund distance learning. So I assured her we would not defund distance learning. <laughs> Chair, one other thing, I believe this with my heart that teachers are now going to learn how to truly flip a classroom, provide the assignments online, support in face-to-face, -face, and, and help those that need the most help in timely manner. I just think the possibilities have expanded for how we deliver our education and support one another. That's all. The president's report is next. Dr. McLennan. I, so I don't know why that caught me by surprise. I, would, I was looking on here for constituent reports, but I, I realized we don't have those at this meeting. So <laughs> uh, let me gather myself up here. Uh, so uh, I just uh, uh, connected to the connected to this last presentation. Someone has an open mic. Um, so, in in the spirit of the presentation you just heard, I just want you to know that. Uh, 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 the three vice presidents and I uh, met with uh, Thomas and Ken earlier this week to begin uh, the serious work of planning out this, this virtual college uh, structure and organization as we start moving forward and identifying key roles uh, that need to be a part of that. So more to follow on that. I don't have anything uh, specific to update uh, you on that um, tonight. Uh, with respect to the outreach centers, <clears throat> uh, Many of us internally uh, met uh, about a week and a half ago uh, with the Bound Boundary County Superintendent Jan Baer and uh, Economic Development Director Dennis Weed uh, to talk about the transition of our planning for uh, serving Bonners Ferry. This morning, uh, another group of us, smaller group of us, met with the county commissioners in an open public meeting uh, to answer questions and concerns about how we would be moving forward tonight. Without going through the whole conversation and presentation, I would say that it was very, very well received by the superintendent uh, in, the very, in the first meeting in terms of the spirit of collaboration and the subject matter experts we had on the, on the Zoom call with them to talk about specific educational needs, um, some of which we've been meeting uh, face to face and on the ground for some time, maybe not as much as we'd like to, 
but also some of the ideas of moving into the future and serving that community better. And, and uh, all of those ideas were very well received without knowing the specifics of how we're gonna work through all those things, both with respect to um, Bonners Ferry and Kellogg, uh, Lita is taking the lead and working with transition teams. Transition team we've established for, or in the process of establishing for Bonners Ferry will include many of those same college folks who were in on the call a week and a half ago, and also uh, key stakeholders and community members. So um, I would characterize the work that we're doing up there as optimistic at this point. Uh, I think uh, there's some certainly a sense of loss with the door to walk through uh, at some point going away. We will be keeping, as you know from my communication last Friday, we'll be keeping Bonners Ferry uh, open and fully functional through the fall semester and assist with the transition. We have a different uh, set of circumstances in Kellogg, uh, not as much use and not as much complexity in terms of uh, 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 Bonners Ferry, uh, but we'll be going through a similar process to work uh, with that community. However, that center will not reopen for fall and we'll begin transitioning our services uh, more fully uh, at the beginning of the fall semester. Uh, the presidents, uh, community college presidents have been meeting on a regular basis uh, throughout COVID-19. Initially, we were meeting twice a week. We're now meeting uh, weekly. We have invited uh, Nat Freeman and Greg Wilson from the governor's office uh, on a regular basis to, to join those meetings as uh, our agenda and or their interest uh, warrants. And at the uh, meeting we held uh, earlier this week, you know, last Friday, um, we discussed the uh, legislation need to increase the tuition cap. NIC is uh, taking the lead on that in terms of uh, the drafting of the legislation. We, the, we uh, Greg Wilson was in that meeting uh, with us last week and we wanna make sure the strategy that we're taking this time we want to make sure that whatever uh, concerns or collaboration collaboration needs to happen with the governor's office uh, happens well in advance of uh, any uh, outreach to legislative legislators and that the outreach to the legislators is done in collaboration with the governor's office so uh, i believe we have the buy-in from the governor's office to do just that um, more to follow on the details and, and how that, uh, that statute language will actually uh, change. As you know, right now, uh, it's a $2,500 annual cap. That cap is about, I believe, 40 years old. We did a calculation of uh, what our tuition was at the time that cap was put into place and it was about $380 a year. And the cap was set at $2,500. So you can see how much has changed over that period of time. The other feature in the in the tuition cap is no more than uh, we're limited to a 10% tuition increase in any one annual uh, budget cycle any one year. Um, if you go back and look at our tuition history uh, as a, uh, a response to the uh, uh, economic meltdown in 2008, we had some eight and nine percent uh, budget increases at, uh, in a few of the years. Uh, back in that time frame, but in the more recent future, of course, you know, they've been very, very limited. There's interest from the governor's office in changing that 10% to something lower. And we're gonna have to uh, figure out where that looks. Um, the percentage that was uh, uh, thrown out in our meeting uh, by Greg Wilson was uh, 5%. So that we lift the cap or take the cap away uh, but limit the increase for community colleges to a 5% annual tuition increase. We'll be meeting again on Friday uh, to uh, discuss this more, but uh, I just wanted you to have a, um, a heads up that that is coming this, this session. We're going to try to move that forward. Summer enrollment is up. Uh, the numbers have come in at uh, FTE at 10.6%. Uh, still not sure how that bodes for fall semester. Um, as we're trending right now, uh, week to week over last year, we're about 11% off from last year. That's not lining up terribly with our 9% budget um, stake in the ground that we put, but obviously we want to do better than that. Uh, the efforts that you heard uh, last board meeting around marketing and outreach have only uh, accelerated and become more robust. And uh, we don't have a presentation for you tonight on those things. 
but it is an all hands on deck and some of the the, uh, the things that are in play are very sophisticated and I think are gonna produce a good result. There's so much uncertainty right now uh, with it's, it's gonna be just in time decision making for a lot of students. They're waiting to see what's gonna happen. Is the country truly you know, opening back up? And I, am I gonna be able to go to my residential four-year institution? Um, but we, you know, we're preparing for multiple scenarios, uh, but I just want you to know that at, at this point, we're not off terribly, but we're still, we're still down where we'd like to be. And then lastly, I'll just mention that I mentioned uh, in executive session tomorrow, we have our uh, 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 annual, our seven year visit with the commission, Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities to review uh, our self-evaluation and the uh, committee report that has been submitted uh, to the commission to determine the outcome of our evaluation. And Dr. Burns and Steve Kurtz and I will be doing that and Chair Dunlap will be joining us uh, as well and that's tomorrow afternoon. I believe we're, again, the result is a good result. The recommendations and concerns that were expressed in the report are uh, recommendations and concerns we share amongst ourselves and we know we have work to do in those areas and are poised to do that. So I don't believe there, will, you know, I think that the meeting tomorrow should go very well. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Any uh, questions or comments for the president? All right, I think we have a uh, KTEC report, uh, Trustee Banducci. Uh, yes, indeed, we had a meeting today. And uh, I have a few things I'll highlight real quick. Um, KTEC has got a uh, record enrollment set for this next term. They're at 459 right now. Uh, they had a lot of applications actually, uh, 480, 490 uh, range, but because of wait listing and people that weren't able to get into classes and other things, uh, we didn't quite get everybody, but at 459, that's a substantial increase, and again, the highest number ever. So um, they're quite pleased with that. Um, but I asked what I should emphasize in my report tonight, and they said emphasize that the support is up, uh, donations are up, there are a number of uh, businesses and, and medical entities that are, are supporting KTEC. Enrollment is up, budget is down. Um, They've been, they've been squeezing it pretty hard, um, really working hard. They've frozen all salary schedule movement. Um, so they've uh, taken a hard look and everybody's accepting to pretty much just stand pat at this point. Uh, so no raises there. Um, we did schedule our next board meeting. We'll be on the 26th of August. And today what we did, and, and uh, we're in the process of saying goodbye to Jerry Keene, who is retiring. He's been the chairman of our board for uh, quite a while now, and he's retiring as the superintendent from the Post Falls School District, so we all wish him well in retirement. And uh, other than that, just trying to see how this is going to play out like we are at the college and uh, the school districts are as a whole. So, and that's my report. Thank you, Trustee Banducci. Any uh, comments or questions for uh, Trustee Banducci? Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Trustee Wood. Uh, just a quick question, Todd. What, um, what career fields are they choosing? What, what had the highest enrollment? You know, Christy, I can't answer that, I'm sorry to say. They, they did not uh, break it out that way, although I will suggest to you that almost everything is full. Uh, that's why there was wait lists and why even though we had closer to 490 applications, people that applied, we're looking at about, again, just, just about 460 for actual enrollments because there wasn't enough space for everybody. I will tell you there is some room in the HVAC program. I know that for sure. Um, in fact, we even talked about that today and we could use some more folks in that, but we're, we're, we're going to continue with it, not take a step back on that because that was one of the places that, that we could save money because that is not a full course but we still felt if we're 8, 10, 12, that we would want to continue with that class. And so, so we will continue with that class, made that decision today. So I know there's room in HVAC and there's a few others, but we are on the CNA, the health services, um, they did hire a new instructor there, 
but we're they're maxed out there. We may even be enough at some point where we have to think about trying to hire someone else again, because uh, that's I think already getting waitlisted again, even after adding an entire new section this past year. Okay, thanks, Todd. You bet. Any other questions or comments for Trustee Banducci? All right, next under old business, we have the second reading of the uh, board member conduct policy and Trustee Howard will present that. The um, a copy that you received yesterday or today of the kind of the revised policy was updated a little bit. As I looked at it, unfortunately, as we removed some of the strikeouts and some of the additions, um, it, it got a little muddled. So we really don't have anything to address in terms of a final copy tonight. But what I would like to do is tell you that I had a good discussion with Todd. Um, he made a couple recommendations um, on some areas that he was concerned with um, without releasing his concern about the policy as a whole. But he made a couple good recommendations, one of which was there's an area under the guidelines that says um, it's uh, the, the board should not uh, try to borrow money, solicit funds, or accept gratuities from any employee of the college unless the activity is otherwise protected by constitution or statute. And he was concerned, and I think rightfully so in listening to him, that there are elections where people from the campus may well have an interest, both in terms of making donations and, and uh, supporting a candidate. So I revised the language on that. Uh, unfortunately, you didn't get it in your copy tonight. Um, to add some of those uh, concerns. And Todd may have some more concerns. So there were a couple other areas, but <clears throat> um, we really don't have a final copy to, to, uh, uh, to review tonight. Christy had made a comment earlier about one in a workshop um, that may have some merit. Quite frankly, I would like to have a copy that has been worked over so that when we sit down, we have kind of a semi-final um, document that we can then focus in on specific areas um, rather than just uh, having a workshop on the whole document. If you want to have a workshop on the whole document, then we might as well just do that now and and dispense with any further discussions until we have the workshop. So we probably ought to discuss that. If, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair, this is Todd. Trustee Banducci. Oh, just real quick, I just want to add uh, along that line as Ken and I were discussing, and one of the other concerns that I had, and I'll just throw it out there, is that we may have friendships with people that are on the faculty or staff. There may be relationships there. And, and, and uh, you know, I, as I talked with Ken, I know he and Al Williams were friends, and I think they had a regular breakfast or lunch they'd like to get together. I don't know if that was weekly. But the way that was written, if one week Ken wanted to pick up the check and the next week Al wanted to pick up the check, would that have been a gratuity from an employee? So. There's ways where inadvertently we we could have been tripped over this just because we had relationships, friendships, you know, outside of the workplace with some of these uh, good people at the college. So that was my concern too, that would preclude us in our private lives from, from interacting with some of these folks potentially, you know. Oh, that was it, just that extra thought. Christy, you had something you were gonna say? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Um, Ken, I would like a workshop. I'd like you to lead it. I don't know that it has to be on the entire document because there's a tremendous amount we agree upon. But I, it would be so great to have us all together um, in person. So this is probably going to have to wait a little bit. Maybe in August we could do an outdoor meeting on campus and be six feet apart. Um, but I would like that opportunity to couple of things just go through and um, make sure that we all see the intent behind the language and we all agree with the language. Um, I'm all for the policy. I just want us all five to spend a little more time on it together. Thank you, Trustee Wood. Also, um, it's two months until we have another meeting. And one of the concerns I have is that uh, as new information is brought forward related to the budget, we may also need a workshop between now and then uh, with regard 
to uh, our budget. And so maybe there's an opportunity to combine uh, both workshops into one, take a little bit longer. And uh, as you suggest, maybe in, in uh, the first part of August might be an appropriate time. Any other questions or comments related to this policy or proposed policy? Well, uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, just for the record, and I suspect so we have a, um, uh, the way we're handling it is the, uh, this has been tabled and I would make a motion that it remain tabled. Uh, until, uh, in, until it's brought up again. <laughs> no, no, seriously, in August or whatever. Is there a second to that? I'll second that. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion to table this policy until it's brought up again, possibly at a workshop, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Under new business, uh, first of all, we have uh, Head Start application for additional TANF child slots with Beth Ann Fuller. Chair Dunlap, board members, Dr. McLennan and guests, thank you for allowing me to come forward and ask for an approval for our program to accept an additional six TANF slots along with the funding that goes along with those slots for an ongoing uh, ability to serve 299 children in Head Start now. Uh, our proposal includes serving those children specifically in Bonner County. Our application to the Idaho Head Start Association gave the demographics for that area and the uh, um, argument that that would be an excellent place to serve those six additional slots. Along with that, um, to be able to absorb those six additional slots, what we would be doing is, is providing an extra classroom that would be located at Harding, which would be at no additional cost because we have an open classroom session here at Harding. And we'd be able to start a classroom with these funds to lower the classroom sizes in several of our classrooms across our program. So in other than having 20 children in a classroom, we would be able to lower classroom sizes to 17 or 18 in four of our classrooms. So that would be how we would change the scope and be able to absorb those six additional slots. Joe, you're mu muted. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sure that was much the joy of everyone listening. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Beth Ann. Uh, I asked if there were any questions or comments for Beth Ann. And of course, you didn't hear me, and so I heard that there were no questions or comments for her. But I'll ask that again in case there are. If Mr. not. Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, Trustee Howard. Yes, uh, Beth Ann. These additional slots, are they going to be in Sandpoint or involving Sandpoint students? Um, so they would be involving Sandpoint students. And so what we do each year is, is decide where specifically we're going to do the reporting on the children. There's additional reporting besides the federal reporting for Head Start for these additional federal TANF slots. They ask almost the exact same questions as the Office of Head Start, but we have to make sure that we uh, report out outcomes for the families and the children. And so this, the reporting would happen in Bonner County in Sandpoint for these particular six students. Currently the 13 other Head Start um, TANF slot children that we have they are um, in Post Falls. So those 13 are reported out in Post Falls. And any year we could um, shift those TANF slots to any 
any center. It doesn't actually move children or move those slots. But we ask that um, in the narrative for the application that we applied to the Idaho Head Start Association, they asked us specifically, what are the demographics in your areas? Where can you best serve these six slots? And so um, Bonner County was our most, uh, it, it, was, it just was our best argument for why we need six additional slots. They have the highest waiting list right now. Um, so even though we will absorb all six slots across the whole program, those six new slots will be reported out in that county that can, um, pretty much shows that they could use it the most. Mr. Chair, um, Beth Ann, the, the motion uh, asked that the program scope of service be changed. Uh, I'm confused by that because I don't know what you mean by scope of service. Um, um, is it a sure. geographic area we're not serving now? And I thought in your description you just gave us that we are serving all those areas and we're just um, expanding the number. So what do you mean by scope of service? So the, so the, that wording comes from the Office of Head Start in when you change your original uh, grant award and the numbers of children that we uh, asked to serve in each county uh, was already presented and they already approved our, our notice and gave us an award. And to absorb six additional slots, we need to redo our center operations schedule and show them exactly how we're absorbing six more slots. And so um, what we'll do is this, if you approve that we, uh, that we can absorb six additional slots into Head Start, what will happen is the Office of Head Start will take a look at this and decide whether they're going to let us absorb those into our federal slots. And then they will decide um, to open up our, our grant to be able to move those slots around so that we can absorb those into our classrooms. So when you say scope of service, you're talking about number of students? Right, and exactly where they're all going to be located at. So the full 299 children, what they would do is say, okay, you wanna serve six more. You have 293, you've given us this map, you've given us the number of children you're gonna serve in each site and how many children in each classroom. They have to decide to open that up and let us absorb those six additional slots and place them into those classrooms and, um, Add, add the additional staff and the additional children to that schedule that has already been approved. And then they would just open it up and let us change those numbers in, in those classrooms. And that would be uh, an addition to our notice of grant award. And they would just uh, let us absorb those and then consider them federal slots. And going forward, then we would report out on all 299 of those children. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to uh, accept six additional students? Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Trustee. I'd like, like to make a motion to approve the request for six additional uh, 10 slots and a change to the program scope of service to accommodate these additional slots. Uh, thank I'll you. Is there a second? Seconded by I'll Trustee second. Wood. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Well, Trustee Wood, Trustee Banducci, are you in favor of that motion? Oh, aye, yes. Yes, sorry, thought you heard yes. Thank you, I just didn't uh, hear all that. All right, Beth Ann, uh, you're good to go. Thank you. Also under new business, the first reading of the Institutional Review Board policy, Dr. McLennan. Thank you, Chair Dunlap. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you have the background. I'll just read a, just a piece of that. The North Idaho College Institutional Review Board was created for the purpose of reviewing any human subjects, any human subjects research conducted by NIC and in accordance with federal reg regulations. 
This includes all research with human subjects, including faculty, staff, and or students as research subjects or by NIC faculty, staff, and or students at any location. The NIC Institutional Review Board was approved by the College Senate uh, as a standing committee earlier in the academic year, and the Senate requested that a related policy and procedure be developed, which you have before you. The policy and the procedure have both been reviewed and approved by myself and the President's Cabinet and the Senate. Any discussion? Related? Chair Dunlap? Uh, yes, uh, Trustee Banducci. Yes, thank you. Uh, President McLennan, um, I apologize for my ignorance, but I don't normally think of us as a, as a research institution. You know, I think more of a UI or a wazoo for such things. What was the impetus for this policy and procedure? What sort of, of uh, research are we doing, especially in the, in the case of using human subjects? Uh, maybe I, I could be enlightened there because I'm not aware of, of what we're doing in that capacity. So we, we do, a, at the institutional level, uh, we do a, quite a bit of uh, research using survey instruments and, and uh, uh, such that we administer to, to students, but also within uh, in the instructional area through student-led uh, research projects uh, or faculty coordinated research projects. Um, there's research, and Dr. Burns, you might want to add a little bit to that through sociology classes and, and other uh, types of um, research that occur in the classroom. Not a lot, but there's some certainly. Well, the reason, I guess part of the reason I'm asking is because, you know, I, my thesis, I had a MD, a couple PhDs, and we were sponsored by NASA, and we were sticking, you know, electrodes in people's heads and spinning them around and inducing drugs and doing a multiple drug therapy, a double blind placebo, and anyway, blah, 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 on human research. And we were you're literally making people sick, trying to work on the cause of uh, and cure for, or at least delay the onset of motion sickness. So when I think of research on human subjects, I'm thinking something that's invasive like that, where we're doing something to their body, which, if I'm understanding you right, we're doing check box A, check box B, submit, because, I mean, that was a school of logistics. They sent out a bunch of stuff. People answered questions. They came back. They tabulated. That was their research. Our side on the engineering, we did things to people. <laughs> so um, so is, is, am I getting that right? We're not really, in, in, a, in a medical sense, affecting anybody. It, it's a more of a, of, a, of a clerical administrative function. Yes. I, I guess, again, I'll ask Dr. Burns to maybe add uh, some knowledge to this conversation. Uh, Chair Dunlap, Trustee Banducci, I would agree with Dr. McLennan and, and with much of what you have said as well. Um, I think the regulations and restrictions about any time that you ask a human, um, even questions that would be on a survey instrument, it is considered um, human subjects because you are using humans rather than animals or plants or whatever it is that you're using to do the research. And so um, by regulation, we should be uh, making sure that the institution is well aware of the intent of the research, how uh, the questioning will go for, uh, on these surveys, and what, how the, that information is going to be used, how we protect the privacy of the um, students and or faculty and staff involved. So it's just making sure that we are attentive to all the requirements related to research when um, we are using humans. I would also add that many of our faculty, just because of their own um, backgrounds and, and the degrees that they've received, they are invited to join in with um, other universities, both in-state and out-of-state, to conduct research. And so if that happens and they are using um, humans involved in their research, um, this has to be, be approved by our institution because of of their connection with North Idaho College. Okay, that makes sense because, yeah, yeah, I, I, what I was doing, we were sticking drugs in people, you know, so to me, that's pretty invasive, but but I could see that as an extension where someone might be doing that in a cooperative effort with another university where there could be human subject research uh, um, beyond just some sort of survey or something. Okay. Okay, well, I appreciate the answer. I just was trying to understand kind of what the genesis of this of this was and, and you know, why, why why it came about. I, so, thank you. Board, further discussion uh, related to the proposed policy? Hearing, 
Hearing none, uh, President McLennan, we would ask that you bring that back at the next meeting for a second reading uh, and potential approval. Next, uh, we need to appoint a clerk of the election. And uh, typically we do this annually when uh, we have trustees that are up for election. And usually the vice president of uh, business is the one that is appointed uh, to do that. And so uh, I would ask for a motion to appoint uh, Vice President Martin as the clerk of the election. Mr. Chair, I'll make that motion. I move to appoint uh, Vice President Chris Martin as North Idaho College District Clerk of the Election for the upcoming Board of Trustees election. And I, Todd Banducci, would be happy to second that motion. All in favor of appointing uh, Vice President Martin as the Clerk of the Election signify by saying aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. All right. Congratulations, Chris. Tab four, uh, approval of the president's contract. Mark Lyons. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Dunlap, members of the board, President McClendon. Um, consistent with past practice, the president's contract is reviewed and renewed annually. A contract renewal may be executed by the president and the board chair with the approval and authorization of the board of trustees. Now the proposed renewal contract um, for this year is, is to extend the contract for an additional year. So it would be to July 1, 20 to June 30th, 23. Uh, that is the only change that is being proposed at this time. The uh, other terms, including compensation are unchanged. So uh, the board uh, is requested to consider a motion to approve the, a renewing a contract for that time period, July 1, 20 through June, or through 6, 30, 23, and authorizing the board chair to execute the contract on behalf of the board and North Idaho College. Is there a motion to that effect? Well, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to make that motion and then hopefully we have some discussion. Um, I will make a motion to approve a renewal contract authorizing the board chair to execute the contract on behalf of the Board of Trustees and North Idaho College. And is there a second to that? I would second that. Murray seconds. Is there uh, further discussion? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to take the opportunity, the board gets to talk to Rick and share with him how pleased we are, but we don't get to talk about it publicly too often. It just doesn't fit into the normal schedule. But uh, Rick, we're all so proud of your leadership and um, the work that you've done through not only just the tough times with COVID, but year round and the heavy lifting that you and your staff have done on the accreditation process, the facilities planning, the strategic planning, um, the budget. It, we could go on and on and on as we do with you privately, but uh, publicly, I think it's really important for everyone to hear that this board is just so pleased with your performance and, and thank you for a job well done. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries, congratulations, President McClendon. You're good to go. Thank you. Next, under informational uh, items, we've got uh, COVID-19 planning update with uh, President McLennan. Thank you, Chair Dunlap. You know, we, we uh, are including this on the agenda and we'll likely include it on the agenda as a placeholder for this conversation um, in the foreseeable future. Uh, as we're in the place that we're in today, I just, uh, I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Burns here in just a second. Uh, but, uh, you know, this continues to be a very uncertain environment. Uh, higher education institutions all over the country are dealing with, we're dealing with much the same things, even though we, we have significant and notable differences within our institutions. Uh, and certainly the regional uh, differences are notable as well in terms of what's happening with COVID-19. 
uh, in different uh, localities. Um, as you know, we went uh, followed uh, the state uh, in large part into stage four of uh, following Idaho rebounds to in our NIC rebounds uh, stage four. And uh, those communications have gone out and telling what that means and it's been distributed widely and available on our website and so forth. We also have, and I mentioned this briefly at the last uh, trustees meeting, uh, a working group. Um, I refer to it as an operations and logistics team. Uh, they have, I think, renamed the, the, the more uh, uh, name and use as the NIC rebounds team. And basically, uh, this group is working, uh, uh, working first with the immediate needs for us to be uh, uh, able to fulfill our mission under the current circumstances, uh, but notably planning for the fall semester and the, the various scenarios uh, that are in front of us uh, for what fall semester uh, may look like. And, and as you know, just from the national news and local news, um, that landscape is still shifting and uh, there's still a lot of variability in what that may look like. Uh, the rebounds group is uh, uh, primarily looking at uh, operational safety and um, uh, uh, workplace related um, uh, measures. And there's a subgroup that's formed um, that's being chaired. And that group is being chaired by Karen Hubbard and she's just doing a terrific job uh, trying to deal with a very complex set of uh, variables and scenarios to, to do this type of planning. And then a subgroup uh, as part of that is also working primarily on instructional and classroom related and instructional delivery, delivery related uh, issues. Um, again, among those various scenarios that are in front of us. Network is being led by uh, Larry Briggs and, and Christy Doyle. Um, these groups are active. They're meeting uh, frequently, I wouldn't say regularly, frequently regularly, and uh, developing their agendas and creating their priorities. Um, and so tonight I thought it would, uh, we gave a pretty full uh, update at last month's meeting. Uh, tonight we're gonna focus on two things in particular, and one is uh, some data on what happened with students uh, in terms of their withdrawals uh, in the spring semester. How, what, what does that data look like? And then a question about, uh, so what does our fall outlook look like? What, what, are, what are our thoughts about programs and services and instruction? And Dr. Burns is gonna handle both of those questions. So Lita, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. McLennan. Chair Dunlap with members of the board and Mr. Lyons, um, colleagues. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about um, what spring looked like. And I believe that at the last board meeting, there was a question specifically to um, the withdrawal, students who withdrew from their classes at North Idaho College. And so I just wanted to review some information with you. I'm gonna share a lot of numbers, but really the spreadsheets were way too large to put on a, a Zoom screen. But if you would like uh, hard copies of any of this information, please just let me know and I'll make sure that we get it forwarded to you. So just in terms of um, the way that North Idaho College tracks withdrawals, we, we track them in a variety of ways. The two most important things that we look at though are the student headcount, and that is the individual number of students who withdraw and the student seat count, which reflects the number of seats in a class that are withdrawn. Um, so for example, if a student, um, if one student withdraws from a course, that would count towards one head count withdraw and one seat count withdraw. But if a student withdraws from three courses, that would count towards one head count withdraw and actually three seat count withdraws. So in the spring of 2020, we had 850 students withdraw from one or more classes from 1,462 seats or an average of 1.7 seats per individual students that were enrolled in the spring semester. The highest proportion of these withdrawals, 51.4% of the total seat count was due to COVID-19. When, when we asked the students the reason, they indicated COVID-19. So that was 752 seats, followed by personal reasons for about 16.3%. And then with, and with those two together, it made up about 67% of the total withdrawals from 
um, the seat count from North Idaho College. The remaining reasons uh, included things, um, well, one, for a number of uh, students, they didn't even state a reason, but other reasons were work and um, other, uh, matters related to their coursework itself. So to compare this to the last three years, just to give you a perspective, if we look at 2018 through 2020, the spring semesters of those years, um, over those years, 15.3% of NIC students' headcount withdrew for one, from one or more courses. And in spring 2020, so the most recent spring, 17.7%, um, which means that there was a little more than a 2% increase uh, against the average, the three-year average, this semester, this past semester, a uh, 2% increase. Then when we look at seat count, it was a 7.2%. And again, uh, uh, that was the three-year average. And this spring, it was about a 9% in uh, withdrawal rate. And so a little bit less than that 2%. So hovered right around the 2%, both for seat count and for head count. So um, what we might be able to um, conclude from looking at these numbers is that indeed there was um, a notable amount of withdrawals, uh, total withdrawals from spring semester 2020, uh, slightly higher than average from the prior, prior two years, but again, within a 2% range there. The, um, <clears throat> the average seats withdrawn student increased only from a 1.5% over those three years to a 1.7%, so not incredibly dramatic. Um, it's probably reasonable to conclude, um, although we don't have hard evidence this, but probably reasonable to conclude that the provisions we made for COVID-19 related to their ability to withdraw without penalty um, made a huge difference for students and making sure that um, NIC's stewardship of students was um, effective in guiding as a guiding principle reflected in this withdrawal, um, this withdrawal data that I'm presenting this evening. I think what's going to be really important is for us now to track of those students who took the, the um, credit for withdrawal this spring semester, as you will recall, for students who withdrew during a certain time period, we allowed them to have credit towards those, course, uh, those courses or other courses um, through this next year, starting with the summer, fall semester, and spring semester. So it'll be really important for us to track the numbers of students who took advantage of using that credit towards continuing their education during this next academic period. And so I'm going to stop there on that particular issue just about the data before uh, I move on to some fall discussion to see if there are any questions. Okay, again, if you would like to see the numbers on hard copy, please just let me know and we'll send them out. Actually, I'll send out those hard copy electronically. Does that make any sense whatsoever? I did that for my buddies, Ken and Thomas. Um, okay, so as we are looking at fall, I don't know an ad uh, how to adequately explain to you all of the planning that has been going on for fall, uh, fall semester. It has been intense and it has been ever changing. Um, it seems that once we get a plan in place, we learn something new, we uh, learn more about what other institutions are doing. And uh, we realize that we always have more work to do to try to ensure the most effective delivery of courses um, in the fall semester in the safest environment possible. So I would tell you what um, the subgroup worked on as well as the instructional leadership team, they've been working on it since uh, March actually, um, really looked at some guiding principles um, led by this notion of that we wanted to ensure continuation of learning in the safest environment possible. And that would be a summary of, of the guiding principles towards this. And so what has been done is um, the team has developed multiple scenarios and really tried to develop scenarios against the pedagogy, the learning requirements for um, the multiple courses that are offered at North Idaho College. And as you can well imagine, that is extremely varied across the institution. Um, at one point uh, from a large, uh, the large planning group that was going on, the NIC rebounds team, uh, we realized that we needed to have a smaller group of individuals look at the multiple aspects of delivery. So it's not just instruction in a classroom or instruction online or a combination of thereof, but this really um, involved what our classrooms look like, how big they are, and if we were going to social distance with 
six feet uh, between every single student in the classroom and the instructor. What does that classroom look like in terms of how many students we can put into that classroom? Um, what technology, out of technology, we're going to need to move to these multiple modalities that uh, we are hoping to be able to implement in fall? And how do we communicate with students these changes in modalities as we put codes into our system to make sure that we know what the delivery method is? How do we communicate that well to students so they you know what to expect to receive in this fall semester. So this team um, was made up of, of people across campus, uh, many other people involved, but the core of the team really was um, the two deans, uh, Christy Doyle and Larry Briggs. Um, Gary Stark from facilities, I'm telling you, he has been an absolute rock star in that he has measured and looked at every single classroom. I think he's been in every single classroom on this campus and really strategically looked at how many people we could actually get into a classroom in a safe manner. So kudos to him. And then Kelly Lyons in the registrar's office. Oh my goodness, she has fought with a um, colleague, our, our system, um, that allows us to register students and to track all matters related to um, instruction and really figured out how to best uh, work with the instructional deans and faculty to make sure that students understand the environment that they're entering into. So there's a lot of background coding. In fact, they had to come up with a whole new nomenclature and add uh, definitions to what these learning modalities are. And, and that will be ready to be uh, released in, a, in a, another couple of weeks. We're going to have all that ready and be online. In fact, faculty and, and the division chair, administrative assistants and division chairs are working as of today, because they got a letter from me today about the changes that need to be made. So as of today, they're working on trying to make those changes in the system. Um, so uh, that, that's the, the worker bees of who really is making this happen. But again, looking at multiple ways of delivery, should we get pulled back to a stage three, to a stage two, or have to completely um, close down the institution again and, and what that's going to look like. As you know, in the springtime, our biggest challenges were around the areas that had hands-on learning that can only be, be delivered hands-on. And uh, that will be a challenge for us in the fall as well as we move into this. This summer, um, you heard last month that um, we started summer school completely online. And um, as of next week, we will, this week and next week, we will actually have people entering into our labs, our science labs, um, to finish out their summer coursework. Yet, at the same time, we still have students in, in some of our labs finishing out their spring coursework because there were so many hours and so much learning that needed to be done that we are still um, wrapping up some of our spring semester courses, um, even in this late month, late end of the month of June. So um, we're looking towards fall and hoping that as we transition into the fall that uh, we are able to deliver as much as possible in the time allowed in the fall semester but realistically, we know that if we are forced to go completely remote again, there will be some instruction that will have to be put on hold again, and we will have to again design a way to move that into the spring semester or at a time that we're allowed to re-enter um, the lab settings. And I think that I've provided um, as much information I could to you in a short amount of time, but I certainly am open for questions on all of this. Questions, comments for uh, Dr. Burns? All right. Lastly, uh, board chair's report, which will be very short. Uh, as mentioned, there will be no meeting in July. Our next meeting will be in August, and we will have a workshop sometime uh, the first part of August related to a proposed policy on board conduct and possibly uh, uh, also related to uh, the budget as new information unfolds uh, about that budget. This has been an extremely difficult year for all of you. If you go back uh, at the beginning of the year and you look at uh, the issues related to the athletic department, you look at the response to COVID-19, um, you look at the yeoman's work done in preparation for accreditation, the decline in enrollment and budget, and facilities planning, 
you all have done a spectacular job. And on behalf of the board, we could not be more proud of this college and the efforts you have made to make sure that our students are served uh, very, very well. Uh, so thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you uh, in this next uh, new school year. Are there any comments for the good of the order? If not, this meeting is adjourned. Again, thank you all.